following program was funded by the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, Office of Education. This was Central High School, Little Rock, Arkansas, 1957, when nine Negro students tried to enter. We're the sunny south. Let's show the nigger he's in the sunny south. And this is 1979. A lot has changed since 1957. We've come a long way. These are the high steppers, the pride of Little Rock Central High. We just teach each other. We, we get along real well and we, you know, act like, like she's my sister, you know. When I made it, you know, she became like a part of my family. In our school life, we're very much integrated, but out in our society, we're not. And so we have a chance to have like what we call bunking parties or slumber parties over at my house. They all come over to my house, my neighborhood. Then the next time we may have a party, we may all go over to Stephanie's or Jennifer's, Karma's, you know, and it gives you a way uh, to round yourself out. As We See It, a series about desegregation in America's high schools, produced by WTTW with high school students. This is As We See It, and it's our chance to tell the world about Central instead of people outside looking in. We've been interviewed by different parts of the media before. Central High is probably, like we said, the the most photographed school in the, in the country. But the media that came in to interview us came down with preconceived notions. This is our chance to tell y'all how we feel about our school and what our history has been like and how it affects us now. For almost 30 years before 1957, Little Rock Central High was all white. It was the pride of the city. Central students passed black students on their way to school, but never even thought of them as classmates. Remember, blacks were called Negroes then, not blacks, and they went to their own schools. That's just the way it was. Everybody was proud of the fact that it was a big school. It was the biggest school in the United States until sometime in the 40s. Since it was already the center of all the kids' social life, you can see its importance, and you can also see possibly why the integration of that generated so much uproar. The things that I thought about when I was in high school, was I think the thing that most kids did in the 50s, uh, we were cheerleaders and uh, we had a good football team and we were looking forward to just all the regular activities that most kids did. Yes, I wanted to be with my friends and do fun things, go to the ball games. And one of the things that we did at Central at least once a week was on the stage we would have dances. But in the morning before school, I think it was a white person's world, probably a white man's world. Most of the blacks that you had any contact with in 1957 were your household workers, sanitation department helpers, and that would be the only contact you would have. In 1957, that's about all I thought about was looking cute today. I didn't think about things like going to the movie and where the blacks sat. They sat upstairs, but I didn't even think about it. If they were allowed in the movie at all, the whole world seemed to be white, at least that revolved around me. Then in 1957, something happened here that will always be in the history books. Nine Negro students tried to enter Central High. Arkansas Governor Faubus stirred up the segregationists and called out his National Guard, saying they were needed to protect against the possibility of violence. In all the confusion, the Negro students had to turn back. They became famous as the Little Rock Nine. I'm Elizabeth Eckford of the Little Rock Nine. That was my first attempt to enter school. I saw the people as I walked up to the school. The guardsmen lined the sidewalk in front of the school. The mob was across the street from the guardsmen. I approached the school and they wouldn't let me pass. I walked a few more paces, and they closed ranks, and one of them turned me in the direction of the mob. 
when I stepped off the curb, that's when there was this groundswell of people behind me. Not, not of them in front of me. So there was only one direction I could have gone, and that was to walk that distance in front of the school where there was a bus stop. But there was no bus. In the film, you can see there are a lot of people behind me yelling at me. I remember this tremendous feeling of being alone. And I didn't know how I was going to get out of there. I didn't know whether I would be injured. There was this deafening roar. I could hear individual voices. But I was not conscious of numbers. I was conscious of being alone. Most Arkansans were upset by all the fuss. And we found out that a lot of the crowd had come to Little Rock from other states. But tensions grew worse. The President of the United States removed the Arkansas National Guard and sent in the U.S. Army so that the Negro students could enter the building unharmed. But I remember the picture in the newspaper of Elizabeth Eckford with jeering white faces behind her. And at that moment, I thought, Martha, you were there. And you never once thought about what was going on with Elizabeth Eckford. You were glad that there weren't any violent demonstrations. You were glad no one was hurt physically. But I think then I realized what hurt can come from words, from silence even, from just being ignored. And when I think about it now, I think about it with regret. 1957 was only the beginning. The fuss died out of the national newspapers, but nine Negro students were on their own inside Central. And it wasn't easy. There were guards stationed in the hallways and in open areas like the gym. We could go to the assemblies and hear that thunderous, thunderous stuff for the Tigers. But um, we were not allowed to partic participate in extracurricular sports or any other type of extracurricular activity. And it was dangerous for us to attempt to go to those activities. I think whites had different reactions to the blacks who were integrating Central in 57. Some of the students I'd known since I was 10 years old who were white were afraid to speak to me in school. There were, of course, a group of vocal whites who were uh, outraged. It's true there were only about 50 students who were actively harassing us. And I think they were reflecting attitudes of parents. But some of those other students, it was my feeling, were co-opting in that violence through their silence. I'm sorry to say now, looking back, that what was happening didn't have more significance and I didn't take more of an active role, but I was interested in the things that most kids are. From what we can tell, that's the way it was for the next 10 years until 1968. Central was a white school with white traditions, and though their numbers grew slowly, Negroes were still sort of visitors. They were foreigners. There was even a language barrier. I had to learn to listen to understand what you were saying because even your speech pattern was totally different. Not just your you know, overall culture, but it's like learning a new language almost. But I don't remember Central like some people remember. I'm proud to graduate from my high school. There was something here when we got here and we had to fall into place to become a part of Little Rock Central High. Sit! In the 60s, you could get a piece of the action if you were a boy and if you were an athlete. I was not only accepted in this school, but in other parts of town because I was a Central athlete. And, you know, that was something you had to live up to, the winning tradition here. Those coaches were the best human relations teachers in the world. Clyde Hort, he shaped my life because he would constantly talk about, this is not a black person, this is not a white person. Let's treat each other as individuals. He's one heck of a man. He's a lifetime hero because I truly love that man. Now, when it came to the classroom, I was accepted in that classroom by most students or I felt like I was, or they were putting up an awful good front, but maybe because I was a Friday night hero. There were a lot of black guys that played sports and everything, but there were no black cheerleaders, 
They didn't have any support. They didn't have any backup. I'll have to agree with her. But we had to adapt to a certain extent because we were the minority. Because I knew nothing about white people. You have to be realistic about it. There was possibly 16% black enrollment when I was here. Now, there was no way you could win a popularity contest. There was no way. Well, then in 1967, one Negro girl made a big jump. She was the first to make the High Steppers team. It's hard to imagine now that it was such a big thing. And it was like, one thing, she broke into a prestige group, and two, we got one over. We got one in. And at the time when she first made it, it didn't matter who, but she would have been the most likely person to make it. First of all, she was really talented. So she had what it took to make the high steppers. And second of all, um, she probably posed the least threat to the white kids and to their, their line, mainly because she blended in so well. If you saw her under the lights at the stadium, you wouldn't know Cora from anybody else. She was just, she might have looked like a nicely tanned white person. Yes, like a white person. In 1967, it still helped if a black person acted or looked white to join in. There was really no pride in being black or looking black. They were still Negroes. When I first came from junior high, I had no hair at all. When I was here, there was not one afro on any woman's head that I remember. I mean, then it was the ivory leg, you know, bald headed. Because I remember my mother wouldn't let me wear one. But outside Little Rock, something historic was happening. Martin Luther King Jr. was putting pride into Negroes. I have a dream. With this thing, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together. I have a dream today. In 1968, King was assassinated, and it shook the whole world. At Central High, the shockwave showed up a year later. Things clearly changed. Negroes were suddenly blacks. Then the Afro came in. Thank God for the Afro. I mean, everywhere, the beautiful hair. That goes to show you the difference one year can make. I mean, attitudes in one year, or not even a year, the summer. The summer. The summer, three months. 69. 69 to the that's, fall of 69. That's right. You know, we came in saying, this will be the best year we've ever had. We're not going to sit still. no longer Negro, caused problems. Whites still ran the show, but they were on the defensive. Blacks had some momentum going now, and there was no turning back. If they couldn't join in, they could walk out. There were two walkouts in 1970. One protested the suspension of black students, and the other was simply a display of black pride. We had a march for Martin Luther King on his birthday. <clears throat> We all dressed in black that day, but the whites misunderstood that. They thought that was a protest of some sort, because at that time, a lot of people didn't understand who Martin Luther King was and what he was doing. Okay. And some blacks, too, I might add. There was no mention of a Martin Luther King in our history book. They didn't know who he was. How could they understand what we were doing? That day, the blacks dressed in all black. And the next day, the white students dressed in all white saying things like white power, this, that, and the other, you know. They misunderstood what that was for. Quite a few of the black students didn't like this because they were mocking what we had done the day before, which we took sincerely. So in retaliation, some black students had black magic markers, and they would write and mark down the back of the white student's white clothing. How could they understand 
During the early 70s, Central began to split. Now there were enough blacks to boycott white traditions. Blacks were saying, if we can only play in our old roles as Negroes, we don't want to play. We want more. In 1972, the play chosen for our senior play was going to be a member of the wedding by Carson McCullough. There were only two parts in the play for blacks, one of a maid and one of a butler. Apparently what happened was some of the uh, black students thought that the roles were slaves instead of what they were, really. I wanted to participate in the senior play, but I felt that I would be degraded playing the part of a maid. I, mean, I knew I could do better. After tryout, a lot of the black students protested the play, and uh, in the end, the play was finally canceled. In essence, there was no senior play that year. By 1973, Central was no longer a white school with visiting Negroes. Whites were holding on to power, and blacks were grabbing all they could. It was a white man's world with blacks intruding, if you want to use that phrase, uh, or blacks entering in. The whites were in control of Central High, uh, as they're now in control of society. And the question is whether they're going to give up some of that control. And at Central, uh, they were faced with that and did. I can call myself giving in order to get inside. Giving up enough of, say, your identity or uh, your black consciousness. In other words, you can't just walk into the student council room and say, look here, I'm, I'm Mr. Black Man and come let me in and I'm going to bust my way in if you don't. You have to go through their channels to get in. Because one of the things we really saw that was defeating us was that we didn't have any type of power to maneuver with. The blacks knew that one black candidate would be running against two or three white candidates and the white vote would be split, so if the blacks stuck together, they could easily win. Among a certain number of whites, there was a feeling of reverse discrimination. Uh, they considered black moves to gain additional student offices through group political action, discrimination against them. For so long, the blacks had felt that we had been deprived of all the different positions, which is why we wanted uh, student council officers or blacks and chilies or whatever. You know, it wasn't a thing of, okay, let's get what we need, and then we'll stop. My hunger's been taken care of now. It was a thing of getting whatever you could get. And it was a newness for the whites to see blacks getting ahead. And I don't think maybe they knew quite how to handle it. Regardless of the whites' political attitudes towards blacks and desegregation, the very few whites knew blacks. I'm your friend in class, but when I get out of class, I don't know you. Regardless of their feelings about the way things ought to be, uh, the reality was that the, the, the races still were very much separate. That's the way it was in the early 70s. A standoff. Competition for power and position. There was no working together. That probably was Central High's worst time, even worse than 57, because we were hurting inside. It drained a lot of spirit from the old tiger. But you know, underneath, I think people were finally ready to share. But no one would make the first move. Then, in 1974, Morris Holmes arrived as principal. I think at the time that Morris Holmes came to Central, it could have gone either way. We could have retrogressed our, our progress as we did. He was what I call an equalizer, and that everything set up within the school consisted of equal number of blacks, equal number of whites, equal number of females and males. There was harmony developing at the time, simply because we were under a faculty that was more equal as far as racial balance is concerned. How are you doing? <laughs> but it was Mr. Holmes' endorsement of this equalization that really uh, brought it together as it is today. The climate and the atmosphere of Central High School uh, was a culmination of the struggle from the 1957. I came at a time very fortunate for me when most of the turmoil had had been worked through when many of the overt frustrations and the overt hostilities were simmering, simmering down. Uh, I came at a time when it was right to, to really get things going, so to speak. Mars Holmes is a young, energetic 
man who knew the names of all the 2,000 students that were enrolled here at Central. He was the kind of person that would get into the lives of the students, not necessarily just here, while they were here at Central, but outside of Central also. Where are you going to school next year? Why did I walk the halls so often? To dig and to be dug, to be there, to listen and uh, have some fun with them. Pass the day. Also, he always seemed to be everywhere at once. If you were out in the halls, he was there. If you were in his office, he was there. I don't know how he did it, and I've never known any man like him, but he was there. And it was good that he was there. Finally, there was someone to lead Central to a new understanding of itself. We began to share the power. For the first time in Central history, the student body elected a black as president. My name is Lloyd Myers. I was, I graduated in 1976, and I was student body president at Central High School. The year before I was president, it almost got to the point of being a riot because people weren't Make willing sure to accept being defeated, and people weren't willing to accept a black in an office. Now, I don't know because there was no poll taken. But I believe that the black and white vote for me was just about equal. So yeah, I'm very proud to have been to have been student body president. And I, and I think that what was achieved my senior year um, was very important and very influential on the way things are now. We are the Tigers! We are the Tigers! The election of Lloyd Myers was the turning point. That's when we began to work together. Since then, we've never forgotten how to do it. <laughs> As the years went by, the high steppers were, you might call, at times speckled with black legs. And until they've gotten to the point now where the 70 eight, 79 high steppers will be 14 black, 16 white, which is about equal, which is, I think, a milestone in Central's history. And the girls get along very well. When we look back and remember 20 years ago, it seems so far away. We're in the sunny south. Let's show the nigger he's in the sunny south. We were more than the uninvited guest. There was much resentment because of the federal presence there. There was resentment because of our presence there. That was 1957. This is 1979. If you're looking for desegregation, you can go in the halls. If you're looking for integration, go to something like the student back of the game. Just picture the scene for a second. You've got 2,000 kids and screaming in the auditorium, and every one of them having a good time. And I think almost all of them aren't even concerned about what color the person is they're sitting next to. For instance, I was on the high clippers to take off that prestigious group known as the, the high steppers. And the guys all dress up in their high stepper uniforms, which do not fit at all. They stuff bras, they, you know, wear balloons, they pop their balloons. And, I mean, it's just a lot of fun. Every facet of the game is desegregated. The high trippers, the queer leaders, the audience. The crowd is uh, kind of bespeckled. So you've got a totally integrated auditorium where you've got 2,000 people together together just to have a good time. Remember the senior play of 1972? The class of 72 wouldn't believe 1979. 
This year, the drama department did a play that was written as an all-white play and cast blacks and whites intermingled in the play. The play was Bye Bye Birdie, about a white rock and roll star, but the rock and roll star was a black guy. That is refreshing. The lead female role was still played by a white girl well, who idolized the black rock star. This is the Ice House. Fun, isn't it? <laughs> of course, when you... The casting was done on the basis of talent, and they were judged on the basis of that. Well, it, yeah, it mattered that he was talented. It didn't matter that he was black. If he wasn't talented, I wouldn't want to perform with him. I mean, Conrad Brody can't just get up there and be a nothing. He's got to have lots of charisma and be able to dance and sing. Through working with As We See It, I've become particularly aware of black-white relationships and black-white incidents. And as just a member of the audience watching Bye Bye Birdie, to see blacks and whites together, having a good time getting together and doing that, and knowing that they had to practice hours and hours and hours together, and just to see them all crying and hugging each other because it was over, it was just a really moving experience for me. Race, as far as black and white, never do come up. It's just we work together, and that it was a very good play, and the hero was black, right? Because you can see how far we've come since, uh, for example, 57, when we did have the integration. Once you get a taste of sugar, you don't too much want uh, something sour again. This was 1957. This is 1979. Our dances here are desegregated, almost integrated. Everybody has a good time together. It's not like every couple is black and white. It's the fact that blacks and whites will go to the same dance, dance together occasionally, and just generally enjoy themselves. That's something that not every school has. There's no black campus hangout or white campus hangout. On campus, blacks and whites are everywhere. But central, everything, nearly everything we do is a central function, not a black or white function. Central is a world, a city. We are what the world outside should be looking on to help them, you know, get together. If everybody could act like we do most of the time at Central, then I think the world would be a whole lot better place. We don't want to go away leaving the impression that all the schools in Little Rock are this way. The city still has its private schools for whites, and the other public high schools may be desegregated, but they're not like Central. Somehow, our experiences have made us unique, and we're all the better for it.